بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حق ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطل ورزقنا اجتنابه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, First of all uh, I would like to say that it's really awesome that everyone made it out uh, in the weather that you're having here Alhamdulillah. Um, I um, came from Maryland, Alhamdulillah, and I thought we were having a cold spell in Maryland until I came here. Uh, <laughs> so, but it's really nice to see, Alhamdulillah, the, com the community come out um, for this event. And I know uh, Brother Osama puts a lot of effort and you know, all the volunteers and everyone else. So I just want to say, Zamallah khair uh, for all the work and effort that has been put into tonight's event. Now, uh, as for our topic for tonight, uh, I want to preface my, my talk for tonight with a, with a couple things. Uh, number one, uh, I teach a seminar with Al Maghrib uh, that deals with the topic of the shaitan as a whole. It's actually a complete study uh, of the shaitan. And we take a look at the shaitan um, from, number one, a theological point of view. So, in terms of uh, as Muslims, what is our belief regarding uh, the shaitan? Uh, what do we know from the Quran and Sunnah, the authentic evidences about? Uh, the shaitan, uh, the, the influences of the shaitan, uh, how the shaitan may affect us. And one of the most important sections in that seminar deals with the methods of deception of the shaitan. Yani, what are the tactics that the shaitan uses to try and uh, mislead mankind? Now, uh, this seminar is about two and a half days long. So I really have a very daunting and difficult task of trying to present uh, this topic in about an hour. So what I decided to do was to focus on the methods of deception of the shaitan and, and even that it's really impossible for me to fully do justice to the topic but I will try my best to cover as, as much as possible. Now when I, when I teach seminars and when I, when I deal with topics like this it's very important to me that these topics are not just um, theology, right? There's not just something that you, read, that you would read in a book and it has no real application in our lives. Um, and I firmly believe that one of the ways that we will uh, revive uh, love for Islam, and especially in this coming generation, is when people begin to see the relevance and application of Islam in their actual everyday lives. So it's one thing, as I said, to read about Islam or Islamic concepts and books, or to hear lectures about them. It's another thing to actually live um, those concepts and to see them applied in our lives. So likewise, you know, the topic of the shaitan, those of you who attended uh, Jum'a khutbah today, uh, I mentioned how there's two like two opposing extreme views regarding the shaitan. So some people are, are, are on one extreme where they, you know, this is kind of this idea that the shaitan, you know, it's not even a, it's not even a real thing, right? It's just a, it's, it's kind of um, a way for us to rationalize uh, our evil inclinations or rationalize kind of the, the evil thoughts or the bad thoughts that we have and there's no actually real b being created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala known as Iblis or the, or the shaitan, right? That's one extreme view. Um, the other extreme view is the, I would say, the opposite of that, which is that yes, the shaitan is real and yes, because he's real, because he influences us, because he whispers to us, we use the shaitan as a crutch. We basically, we, we treat the shaitan as someone that we can hang our blame upon. And if we commit a sin, we just blame it on, on the shaitan. Oh, the shaitan made me do this, and it's the influence of the shaitan, as if we have not been given uh, free will. And both of these are incorrect. The, 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 the correct understanding that we have regarding the shaitan, once again, is the middle path. And as, as Muslims, we will always find the Islamic aqidah, Islamic faith, Islamic theology is always uh, in the middle. So yes, we do believe that the, that the shaitan is a real being that created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and Allah has given the shaitan certain abilities and Allah has given uh, the shaitan uh, amongst the abilities, you know, the ability to whisper to mankind and to tempt mankind and so on and so forth. Um, that being said, uh, we cannot come on the day of judgment and blame the shaitan for anything that we have done. Because in the end of the day, the shaitan doesn't force us uh, to do anything. Um, Rather, it is our own free will. And there's a very interesting um, ayah in Surah Ibrahim, which is, you know, the scholars have, have titled it the Khutbah of Iblis. Khutbah Iblis li Ahlin Nar, the Khutbah of, of Iblis, the Shaitan, 
for the people of the Hellfire. And I would actually encourage everyone to take an in-depth look at this, uh, this khutbah of Iblis because it's very telling. And just to go over it really quickly, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, and this is verse number 22, I believe, from Surah Ibrahim. Um, that the shaytan will speak once the matter has been decided. And the matter, what, the matter that Allah is speaking about here is that the judgment has already taken place. Yani there are people uh, who have been given the judgment that they're going to the hellfire and then there are people who have been given the judgment that they're going to paradise. So the matter, the matter has been decided. At that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the shaytan will speak. He will address uh, mankind. And some of our scholars mentioned that he specifically he is addressing Ahlul Nar, the people of the hellfire. So after the judgment has been given, subhanAllah, people are gathered together and they have already been given the news, they're going to the hellfire, there's no turning back, Qaras, you know. And now the shaytan addresses these people and he says, Inna Allah wa'dakum wa'd al haqq. He says, Certainly Allah had promised you the truthful promise. Wa wa'adtukum. And I had made promises to you as well. However, I betrayed you. Right? So in your life, you had promises. Promises that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made to you. Right? So, for example, amongst the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that there will be a day of judgment. There will be a reckoning. From the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that if we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are finding our path or we're taking a path to Jannah. So, amongst the promises of Allah is that heaven is real and hell is real and so on and so forth. And then the shaytan had promises as well. So the shaytan may whisper to someone and say, you know, all of this heaven and hell stuff, the stuff of the afterlife, is it even real? Like you've never seen what happens after you die, right? It's all just a, a made up story and you know, it's just a way for us to, you know, not deal with death properly as you know, you hear many atheists and so on and so forth say, right? These are shubahat, these are doubts that the shaytan may bring. So these are some of the things the shaytan may say to us while we are living. And now on the day of judgment, when heaven and hell are now real for us, the akhirah, afterlife, first of all, is real. Um, heaven and hell is real. The day of judgment is real. We all know it, understand it. Now the shaytan comes and in a way he taunts mankind. And he says, uh, wa haqq. Allah had promised you the truthful promise. So in this life, the shaytan won't come and, and speak this truth to us. But in the afterlife, he has no choice but to speak the truth, right? So he says, the promises of Allah were true. وَوَعِدْتُكُمْ And I made promises to you as well. فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ However, I betray those promises. And then he says, وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ And you know what? I had no authority over you. I, had no con I, could, I, didn't, I didn't make you do what you did. Right? I didn't force your hand. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't force you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَّا أَن دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي Except, he says, right? So I didn't force you, except that I gave you da'wah. Right? I called you, I invited you. And what did you do? فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي And you answered my call. And, you know, the, the scholars of language, they talk about the letter fa here. And fa is immediacy. Right? So he doesn't say, wa istajabtum لِي Meaning, there's some time in the middle. I, I called you. And you thought about it and whatever, and you took your time. No, he says, فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي Meaning, immediately. I, gave, I tempted you, I whispered to you, and immediately you, you answered and uh, you, rep you responded to this uh, temptation. And then he says, فَلَا تَلُومُونِي So don't blame me. Right? Meaning, for those who think that we can just come on the Day of Judgment and say it's the shaytan, the whispers of the shaytan. And sometimes, by the way, it's not even just the shaytan. You know, there are people who don't blame the shaytan, but they may blame society, right? Oh, it's just that the society is bad. There's too much temptation. There's too much fitna. You know, we're living in bad times and so on and so forth. As if to say, I have no control. It's just, this is the circumstances we're in. Sometimes we blame our parents. We blame our household. And without a doubt, right? The, the parties who take part, those who take part in that, and if our parents didn't do a good job teaching us right from wrong, that is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's something that they will have to answer for. And yes, parents do have a great influence on their children, but we cannot come and say, it was all my parents' fault. Right? As long as we have been given free will, as long as we have the mental capacity um, to, to choose between right and wrong, then we cannot blame our parents or you know, society and so on and so forth, even the shaytan whose influence is very real and it can be very strong. 
So he says, فَلَا تَلُومُونِي He says, so don't blame me. If you're going to blame anyone, وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame yourselves. Right? And this shows us, uh, you know, our scholars talk about how this is one of the evidences of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us free will. That we are not forced, you know, there's some people who believe that Allah uh, forces us to, because Allah has decreed everything, that it means that we are forced to, to do what we do. Right? We have no free will. And, you know, Ahlul Sunnah, this is not our belief. Our belief is that, yes, everything is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also Allah has given us the will, the free will, to choose. Yes, everything happens by the will and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah has knowledge of everything before it happens without a doubt. And everything happens by the permission of Allah, by the will of Allah, but we are given the free will. If we weren't given the free will to choose and to decide, then how, why and how could we be held accountable for that which we do? Right? So this is one of the evidence. So the shaitan says, وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Blame, فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ That do not blame me, uh, blame yourselves. And then he says, مَا أَنَا بِمُسْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي So he says, I cannot be, I cannot, you know, the word musrikh, by the way, comes from the, 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 the root sarakha, uh, which sarikh, um, does anyone know what a sarikh is? What is a sarikh? Or a sarakha, what does that mean? Scream. To scream, right? To yell, to shout. And the reason why this, or one of the reasons why this word is used here is that, you know, the, 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 uh, the scholars of tafsir, they say that the people are now screaming. You know, the people who are headed to the hellfire, they're, they're screaming. Meaning they're, they're now very upset because the shaytan is coming now. He's, he said, you can't blame me, right? This is all you. You cannot put it on me. I didn't force you to do anything. I just invited you. You answered my call. And now people, and there's no turning back now. Because qudiyal amr, the matter has been decided, right? There's no, once the, the judgment is given, so and, so and so is going to the hellfire, khalas, the matter is decided. And people know and understand this. And now they see the source, some people who they thought this is the source of their problems, the shaytan, Iblis comes, and now Iblis says, I can't help you, right? Ma ana bi musrikhikum wa ma antum bi musrikhi. I cannot help you, and nor can you help me. Right? People are yelling and they're screaming, help us, help us. And to, to really show how, um, how weak the shaytan is, and to show, and there's another point to be made here, is that the, it's not like the shaytan tempts us and he whispers to us, and he himself, he's going to paradise. No. The shaytan knows, Iblis knows he's going to the hellfire. But his goal is to drag as many people from Bani Adam with him as possible. Right? That's, that's, that's his goal. Right? That he knows he's going to the hellfire. And this is, you know, the, the story of, of, of Iblis and the, and the shaytan. He knows he's already destined to the hellfire. And now his goal is to take as many people with him uh, as possible. So he says, وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمُسْرِخِي He says, nor can you uh, help me. إِنِّي كَفَرْتُ بِمَا أَشْرَكْتُمُونِ مِنْ قَبْلِ He says, I deny any association that you made with me before. Meaning you associated me with Allah. You listened to me instead of listening to Allah. You obeyed me instead of obeying Allah. I have nothing to do with that. And by the way, this is one of the common tactics of the shaytan. To bring people to the edge of their destruction and then say, I have nothing to do with you. Right? And there's numerous stories that we have that, that talk about this issue of how the shaytan leads people and like step by step helps them to get to the point of their destruction. And when the matter is truly severe, and he, right at the end, he says, I have nothing in anybody in minkum. Right? I have nothing to do with you. I'm free from you. And then he says, in الظَّالِمِينَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ He says, certainly those transgressors, the transgressors, the wrongdoers, they will have a painful punishment. And subhanAllah, the word that he uses is also very interesting, ظالم. You know, people who are listening to this, the people who are headed to the hellfire, many of them, they will say, ظالم. أنا ظالم. Right? I'm the ظالم. I'm an oppressor. People will say, I remember who the oppressors were. So-and-so who oppressed so-and-so. Right? The leader of so-and-so country. I don't want to name names, right? But the leader of so-and-so country. And, this, and he killed so many people and he oppressed so many. I wasn't a ظالم. I didn't oppress anyone. Until people realize that the dhulm that is being spoken about here is the dhulm that we do to ourselves by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The dhulm that we do to ourselves. ظَالِمٌ nafsi, Right? The dhulm, the, how we oppress ourselves by listening and obeying the shaytan instead of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in general, you know, in the, I wish I could spend a lot more time on the khutbah of Iblis. 
uh, but this, there's so many lessons to be learned from the khutbah of Iblis. But what this does teach us for the purpose of our session tonight is our understanding of the shaytan. That he has tactics, he has methods that he uses to uh, get us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but that doesn't mean that we can blame the shaytan. It doesn't mean we can come on the day of judgment and say that it was his fault and so on and so forth. We also know, as I said earlier, that the shaytan has methods of deception. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the khutwat of shaytan. Not a khutwa, but khutwat, plural. Meaning there are different methods that he takes to mislead human beings. Also we know about the shaytan that not only does he have different methods of deception, he uses different methods of deception differently according to the individual. So even according to a person, the person's level of iman, the shaytan may deceive this person differently. So the way the shaytan will deceive, for example, a scholar is not like how the shaytan will try to deceive a layman. He will use different tactics based off of the individual. Right? There's a very interesting discussion that Ibn al-Qayyim ta'ala has regarding major sins, the kaba'ir. And he, he, posed, he, he, puts a, 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 he mentions this, this one point where he says the main party that the shaytan tries, like the work he works the hardest against when it comes to major sins, is which party? Does anyone know? Muslims, non-Muslims, who? Scholars. Very good, right? And we would think, scholars, right? That's a waste of time. Because how many scholars is he going to, going to mislead? What is the point of that? And by the way, the shaytan, one of his strategies is, you know, I usually say he tries to get the most bang for his buck. Right? The most amount of people that he can mislead, the most he can do with the least amount of work. Right? So we, if we would think, I knew, why would the shaytan bother with scholars when it comes to, to, to uh, scholars and people in positions of leadership and so on and so forth? Why would he bother with them when it comes to major sins? Number one, it's a lot of work because this person has knowledge of the deen and so on and so forth. And, and, and number two, it's going to be very difficult. But if you look at what the shaytan gains out of that, you realize why he works so hard on the people of knowledge and people of positions of leadership. One of the things is that imagine if the shaytan misleads one scholar, right? What is going to happen? Well, the scholar, the, the person in a position, a position of leadership, they're not by themselves. They have hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who follow them and look up to them and so on and so forth, right? So the average person now, he looks at the scholar and he says, oh, this scholar con uh, committed a kabira, they committed a major sin, what hope do we have, right? If this scholar can fall into this sin, then we're just laymen, we're not scholars and so on. What hope do we have for ourselves? And how many people, hundreds, thousands, can possibly lose hope? Right? And give up and say, you know, there's no point, Annie, what's the point of me protecting myself from this sin if the scholar can fall into this sin? And that's why the most bang for his buck, the most he can get out of the least amount of work. Number two, because a scholar is, is in a position of leadership, the scholar is in a position where they are a public figure, they have a status, they have a reputation, so on and so forth, a scholar is also more likely to try and defend their position to keep their reputation intact. And a scholar may try to justify that sin, try to rationalize that sin. And when a scholar rationalizes a sin and justifies a sin, it's not like when a layperson justifies a sin. Because a layman can come and say, such and such sin is okay. It's actually not bad and so on and so forth. And how much damage is this person going to do? Maybe a couple people. Maybe his, own home, his friends, his homies or whatever. Like a couple people, that's it. But when a scholar comes and says, you know what, this is actually not a sin. Right? How much damage will that scholar do? How many hundreds, thousands of people will be misled because a scholar rationalized this sin? Because what is, what is, what is the responsibility of, of layman? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of remembrance, the people of knowledge, if you don't know. Right? So a person who is not an alim, he's not a scholar in the deen, their responsibility is to find someone who is knowledgeable, someone who is credible, someone who has a qualification, and ask them. Just like when we go to the doctor, right? We're not all, we don't live our lives all becoming doctors and, and surgeons and so on and so forth. We can't live like that. Not everyone can become a surgeon. So what do we do? We need surgery, we go to a surgeon. 
How do we find a surgeon? Who do we, well, or a doctor? We find somebody who's qualified, somebody who's educated, so on and so forth. And then we put a certain level of trust in them because of their qualification and their education. Likewise, with Islam. Right? A layman has a question, they go to a scholar. For the most part, you know, they, they trust this person, so the scholar gives them the answer. And so now, as I said, when a scholar justifies or tries to rationalize a sin, how many hundreds and thousands of people are misled? So now, the shaitan, the way he would approach a scholar to commit a major sin is not like he would approach a layman. So once again, this tells us what the shaitan, he tailors his methods of deception according to the individual. And that is why, you know, when I teach the, the seminar on the shaitan, part of that process is not just learning about the shaitan. A big part of defeating the shaitan is, is, is learning about ourselves, is understanding ourselves, is understanding our own fears and desires, for example. Because the shaitan will use our own fears and desires against us. Someone who is, for example, struggling to put food on the table at home, to provide for his family, Right? And they're offered a, a, a job which is, has a haram income for them. Right? So the shaitan will use now his fear of poverty, right? his desire to provide for his family, and say, look, if you don't take this, even though it's haram and the income is haram and so on and so forth, but your, <clears throat> your family, how is your family going to eat? Right? So now he uses this person's own um, desires and, and fears, or the fear of poverty and so on and so forth, against this person. A wealthy individual, the shaitan may not use that type of tactic, or we may use it in a different way. So um, with the time that I have, inshallah ta'ala, I want to go over some of the major methods of <clears throat> deception, inshallah ta'ala, and I will give examples um, from different categories of people, different categories of people, inshallah. So we'll start off <clears throat> with what is known as um, the distortion of reality. So one of the things that the shaitan tries to do is distort the reality of matters. And this happens in one of two ways, or we could say two general ways. Very simple. Either to take something good and make it seem bad, or to take something bad and make it seem good. Y'all with me? Let's say it again. What's the first one? Take something good and make it appear as what? Bad. Or take something bad and make it appear good. Very good. So an example of this, actually we see with Adam alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is part of the, obviously a longer story, but when Adam alayhi salam was placed in paradise with his wife, what method of deception did the shaitan use against Adam alayhi salam? He actually used a few different methods of deception, but one of, one of the methods, methods of deception was the distortion of reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Taha, فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانِ the shaytan whispered to him. Who is the him here? This is Adam alayhi salam. Qala ya Adam. He said, O oh Adam, hal adulluka ala shajrat al khuld wa mulki la yabla. He said, O oh Adam, should I not tell you or direct you towards a tree of eternity and a type of possession that will never deteriorate? Okay, what does that mean? So basically, Ib Iblis, the shaytan, comes to, to Adam alayhi salam. And, you know, you have, to, you have to imagine, once again, you know, how the shaitan tailors his methods of deception accor according to the individual. Adam alayhi salam is where right now? Where is he? Where is he? Jannah. He has everything. He doesn't have a desire for, really a desire for anything. Right? What could he possibly tempt Adam alayhi salam with? And, and for us to try and understand what that feels like, maybe think of someone who in this life uh, has everything. Maybe they have wealth and, and status and, and so on and so forth, right? Maybe a king or uh, some, something like that. What do they want more than anything else in life? Well, one of the things they'll say is to hold on to what they have for as long as possible. Right? That's what they They already have everything. You buy them a car, it's like, I got a car. You buy them a house, like, I got a house. You try to give them status, I got status. Anything you give them, it's already have it. So what do they desire? Not more things. They desire to hold on to what they have for as long as possible. Right? So Iblis is basically, he's like, oh, you like Jannah? You like all the, the, the pleasures of Jannah? Like, yeah, that's great. How would you like to have this forever? Eat from this tree, right? Shajrat al khuld A tree that if you eat from it, you will remain here. And a type of possession that, that will stay with you forever. And one of the examples I usually give is, 
I used to tell my students, think of, think of like your favorite food. I don't know how many people ate before they came. Um, hopefully you haven't. Maybe you have a little bit of an appetite. I want you to think in your head what your favorite food is. All right, so I don't know about you, but my example would maybe be like a, a cheeseburger or something. Like a really nice, like a gourmet cheeseburger. Imagine if somebody came to you with your favorite food and said, you know what? You can have this forever. What would you say? Well, first of all, you'd say, well, that's kind of cool, um, but I know I'd get sick of it, number one. And number two, I ain't trying to get fat, right? If I eat it every day, if I have a cheeseburger every day, I don't know about you, but myself, I know I'm gonna gain weight, right? A person says, no, 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 no. Imagine a cheeseburger, that, that first bite that you take, that first delicious bite after you've been hungry for a long time, you have that first delicious bite of that cheeseburger, Imagine every bite that you take tastes like that. And imagine that you will never be, you never feel full, you never feel, un, you never feel uh, uncomfortable, it's not gonna affect your health, you're gonna feel, every bite is gonna feel great. How would you feel? I don't know about you, but to me that sounds amazing. Right, I'll go for one of those right now, if there's such a thing, but there isn't, right? So this is what Adam alayhi salam, this is what, this is what uh, Iblis is saying to Adam, like, oh, you're enjoying paradise? How about you hold on to it forever? And this is one of the ways he tried to entice Adam salam. The reality of this tree is what? The reality of the fruit of this tree is what? It's a sin, right? The one thing that he was instructed not to approach, not to eat from. But the shaitan didn't come and say, hey, come eat from this tree because you know what? It's the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come eat from this tree and you know, you will be able to disobey Allah because he knows that if he presented the reality of the matter to, the, to, to Adam alayhi salam, he would say never. So what does he do? He distorts the reality of the matter, right? Likewise for us, I mean, I want you to think about how many things we have in our lives that if we know the reality of the matter, we know they're not good for us. We know they're bad. But in that moment, whether it's instant gratification or whatever you want to call it or however you want to classify it, it, it appeals to us. You take, it the, take a look at the very aspect of zina, right? Sex outside of marriage. The reality of that matter is, if you were to take a look at all of the problems that come upon a society and upon families and communities because of zina, it would never make sense that people would commit zina. I, I just have to say one thing, and it should set everybody straight, and that is STDs. STDs are a reality, right? And you know, that's a very real danger. And it should be that we should say to the, this generation, or any generation can fall victim to you know, the temptations of, of you know, zina, but we should be able to say to someone, look, you could get an STD. So because of that, how about you don't do it? And ideally, we should be like, that's enough of a deterrent, right? But is it? Is it a deterrent? For some people, yes, but for a lot of people, it's not, right? Why? Because in that moment, in that time, that act seems very appealing, right? And that instant gratification that a person gets or that pleasure the person gets in that moment, it kind of nullifies even facts that people know about the problem, right? Smoking. Many people start smoking at a, at a young age, or, or it used to be like that, now it's more people have started vaping at a, at a younger age, but back when I was growing up, a lot of people, I, I went to public school, right, I didn't go to Islamic school or whatever, uh, I had friends and whatever, people started smoking in high school. And I remember how it was, right? There's no, even people in high school, like everyone knew smoking is bad for you. Everyone, kn everyone knew that it'll kill you. Everyone knew that it can cause cancer and so on and so forth. Everyone, knew, everyone knows the problem. Right? It's not that you know, people don't know, it's just that in that moment, it is beautified for us. The shaitan says, I will beautify for them that which is upon her, meaning that their sins and their, and their desire, the shaitan will beautify them for us. So in that moment, whether it be social you know, acceptance or wanting to, to fit in with a certain group or, or just the, the, the pleasure a person gets from rebelling or doing something that our parents may not like, whatever that teenage issues are, uh, whatever teenage issues are going on at that moment, whatever it is, that makes that very action seem very appealing, right? And this is, and this is, this is why it is important to understand our own temptations and our, our, our like where are we as individuals, that's why every single one of us, 
we have our own fears and desires and so on and so forth that the shaitan uh, can use against us. Uh, distortion of reality, as we said, taking something good and making it appear bad, or taking something bad and making it appear good. Um, if I were to say to you, okay, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, labels, right? Labels. When we put labels on, on individuals, on groups, it's a very easy way to distort the reality of individuals. Because we put people in these nice, neat categories, in these groups, in these bubbles. And that makes life very convenient for us. Liberal, conservative, even practicing Muslim, non-practicing Muslim, this, that. Whatever group we decide to put others in, what that does is it otherizes them for us. If they're in a different group, that means I don't need to talk to you. I don't need to have a conversation. I already know what you believe. Uh, we make assumptions about what, what is in a person's heart. We make, we make 10 different judgments. And once we do that, it means we don't have to have a conversation with this person. So what is happening is the shaitan is able to distort the reality of human beings. You know, today in the khutbah I spoke about even an, an Islamophobe. An Islamophobe is still a human being. Islamopho an Islamophobe, how many Islamophobes have not only changed the way they think, but have actually accepted Islam, right? It seems like every other day we have a new story of someone who's like, yeah, I used to hate Muslims, and now I'm actually Muslim, right? But imagine that no one gave da'wah to that person. No one spoke to them as, as a human. We just viewed them as, oh, this is our enemy. This is somebody who hates us. We never want to talk to them. We never want to have a conversation with them, right? Distorting the, the, the reality uh, of matters. And well, like, there's a lot to be said um, in this category, but I want to get through as many categories as possible, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully in the Q&A we can get to some more examples um, of this uh, as well. Okay, so the second uh, method of deception that I want to uh, speak about is extremism. Extremism. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, Allah never orders anything except that the shaitan takes two contradictory stances towards it. Yani that when Allah orders something, the shaitan is happy as long as we fall into one of two camps. Either shortcoming and negligence or overzealousness and exaggeration. Anything but the middle path. Right? So the shaitan will say either leave it, be negligent, be, do nothing or do it too much. And that's why oftentimes when we think of extremism, we only think of one side of extremism. We think about going too, doing too much, going too far. Right? And that's only one side of extremism. And you know, the example I usually give uh, is even something as simple as taking a shower. Uh, if you meet someone and they say, you know, I take uh, 12 showers a day, how would we react? Right? Will we consider that to be extreme? Yes or no? Yes. I don't know about here, you know, in this area, but definitely <laughs> on the East Coast, Right, 12 showers, we would say, yeah, that's extreme. Now, let's say you meet another brother who says, yeah, you know, here in the Chicago area or whatever, it's super cold, so I just shower once in the winter, and in the summer I take one shower as well. How would we react to that? Would we consider that to be extreme? Yes, it's just the other end of the spectrum. Right? So the, the shaitan, he is happy with us and that's why this is a very powerful tactic because oftentimes extremism leads to extremism. People don't go from one, normally, people don't go from one extreme to the middle path. You know? They go from one extreme to the other extreme. How many times have we seen um, someone, and you know, many people have gone through this uh, scenario, but uh, someone who either uh, is new to Islam, they, you know, they come to Islam, or they start practicing Islam at a certain point in their life, and they're like 100%, right? And they go all out, right? Alhamdulillah, which is good. And that's normal, by the way, because, you know, we're flooded with Iman, and, you know, our, our faith is very strong, and we want to do everything 100%, 100% of the time, we want to be the perfect Muslim, and we just, we're just going at it 100%, right? 120%. And then there comes a point where it becomes too much, a person can't handle it, right? It's just they overload their life. And from that point, in many occasions, they're not like, okay, I need to slow down a little bit, right? Get back to my basics. Maybe just stick to the fara'id for now, the obligatory matters, right? And build upon that, no. 
Sometimes from that extreme, going that far, the shaitan says, you know what? This is too much for you. Maybe this is not for you. Maybe people were right when they said this is just a phase. Right? Maybe this is it's just too, this, this whole you know, Islam thing, or practice, it wasn't meant for you. This whole religion thing wasn't meant for you. And so he entices people to go from that extreme to the other extreme. People just completely leave everything. Right? So one extreme uh, to the other uh, extreme. Um, once again, the, the other matter, uh, I'll give another example in this category, um, khushu' in our prayer. We have this idea sometimes, um, and the shaytan sometimes tries to convince us that either you, you have a perfect prayer or there's no point in praying. Right? That either you, um, you have a prayer where you're focused 100%, and you know, many of our fuqaha don't mention that khushu' you know, uh, presence of mind and heart is from the, condi- from, from the requirements of our prayer. So if you're not concentrate, if you're not, if you don't have khushu' then your prayer is not valid, right? So the shaytan will come and say, look, how many times in your salah were you thinking about other things? How many times, actually, how much of your salah did you actually concentrate? 10%, 5%, what is the point of this type of salah, right? And so it's either all or nothing. And the reality is, is that just like our faith, just like our iman, no one's salah is perfect. There's not a single human being who is 100% focused 100% of the time. And if it's that or nothing, then everybody would be at nothing. Even the people with the highest levels of iman. You, look, you, know, you think of your scholars and so on and so forth. Even they have prayers where they get distracted or they think of other things. But the shaitan won't tell you this. He'll make you believe that you know, because you're not perfect, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your faith. And because of that, people leave their salah. Right? I'll give you another example, which is, you know, a person who prays two prayers a day, right? Require, we're required to pray five prayers a day. But the shaitan, well, even a person who prays two prayers a day, the shaitan will come to them and say, you're only praying two prayers, <clears throat> you're supposed to pray five, what is the point? And a person will leave even the two prayers that they're praying, right? Like as, you know, I was talking about khushu'ah. Khushu'ah, by the way, even the fuqaha, when they, when they give the definition of khushu'ah, khushu'ah doesn't mean that you're concentrating 100% of the time. Khushu'a means that when we are distracted, we make an effort to reconnect our heart to the salah. That's what khushu'a is. Meaning as long as we're struggling, it means we have khushu'a in the prayer. But if we stop struggling, we stop trying, that means that we've lost khushu'a. Right? We're like, I don't care. Whatever my prayer is, it is. Whatever. I don't, we don't, I don't even make an effort. Then that's, that's problematic. Right? Khushu'a means, yes, I'm praying. Okay, I get distracted. I, I struggle, you know, I, 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 I struggle to, to, to reconnect my heart. Even that, that, that constant struggle in our prayer, that means that we are, we are making an effort to, um, to, to have khushu' in our prayer. And inshallah ta'ala, that is something which is uh, considered khushu'. Uh, I had... Um, <coughs> I had a, someone come to me, uh, and they, they, were, they, they said, you know, I, I'm having a problem in my faith, and I need to talk to you, um, dealing with a problem. And I said, okay, what is your problem? And um, they said that, um, you know, I recently started practicing Islam. I, uh, you know, I come, my, my family is, is Muslim and so on and so forth, but, you know, I led like a sinful life or whatever. I wasn't practicing Islam. And now I have started practicing Islam, but now I'm overwhelmed with the feeling um, that Allah will not uh, accept my Islam from me, right? That Allah will not accept my prayer because of all of my previous sins. And I told them very quickly that this is definitely the influence of the shaitan. And this is what the shaitan wants you to, 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 to feel so you lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That, that you have to feel that you are either a perfect Muslim at all times in your life or there's no point of, of even trying. Right? The reality is, and as, I, as I told this brother, every single human being commits sins. Right? Every single individual has, has lapses in their iman, in their faith, they make, they make mistakes, so on and, and so forth. If, the, if that was the case that you know, we didn't commit sins, then there, there would be no point of, of, a, of a reckoning, there would be no point of a struggle in this life. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, didn't create us to be perfect. Allah has another makhluq which is perfect, which doesn't sin, which obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 100% of the time. Who are they? Malaikum. The angels. 
right? And actually, we have the hadith um, of Hanzala radiallahu an, who Hanzala, you know, it's a, a well-known story. He's he's saying one day about himself, Nafaqa Hanzala, Nafaqa Hanzala. Hanzala is a hypocrite. Hanzala is a hypocrite. Or Hanzala committed hypocrisy, and you know, the the companions ask him like, why are you calling yourself a hypocrite? He says because. When I'm with the Prophet ﷺ, I feel my iman like very strong. He says, I can envision heaven and hell in front of me. And that, that's a way for him to say, like, it's, my, if my faith is so strong, it's as if I can see heaven and hell in front of me. I mean, how strong would our iman be if we could actually envision heaven and hell, right? He says, however, when I go home, I get busy with my family and my business and my children and so on and so forth, and my iman isn't the same, right? And some other companions say, well, we have that feeling as well. So they go to the Prophet ﷺ and Hanzala explains his situation to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ says, O oh Hanzala, if you were to be in that state at all times, meaning if you have that high iman, 100% of the time he said the angels would descend from the heavens and they would come shake your hand even if you're laying in your bed. Because you're no longer a human being at this point. If you think that your iman is always going to be at 100%. He said, Walakin, sa'ata wa sa'a. He said, rather an hour and an hour. Or, or a time and a time. And there's some times where your iman is going to be high. There's some time where your iman is going to be low. Right? That's just the nature of our iman. That's why we try our best to maximize in the things that will keep our iman high. Number three, uh, procrastination and laziness. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, in the mention of Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said that when we sleep, uh, the shaytan ties three knots at the back of our head. And with each of them, he breathes the following words. He says, the night is long, so keep on sleeping. The Prophet ﷺ said, if the person wakes up, Allah, if he remembers Allah, one knot is undone. If they make wudu, the second knot is undone. And if they pray, then all three knots are undone. And they get up lively and in good spirits. Otherwise, they get up in low spirits and being lazy. Now, this hadith is such an amazing hadith. Because I think many of us have actually lived this hadith. And it's the following. The day on which you get up and pray, pray Fajr has a very different feeling than the day on which we don't pray Fajr. Right? I think many people have experienced this, that just the fact that we got up in the morning and we prayed Fajr can change the trajectory of our day. Right? So one of the lessons we learned from this hadith is that one of the goals of the shaytan, one of his methods of deception, is to get us to procrastinate and to be lazy. And we can take this a little bit on a macro level as well. Some people procrastinate even with their spirituality, even with their faith. How many people say to themselves, you know what, um, I do want to be a good Muslim, I do want to make an effort towards Islam, I want to start practicing, just not right now. Right? Let me finish college, for example, and then I'll do it. And then they finish college and it's like, you know what, you know, I gotta, I gotta work, I gotta get a job, and this and that, I don't have time for all this. Once I get a job, that's when I'll start practicing Islam. And then they get a job and it's like, oh, but I gotta get married. You know, I, I, you know not, not, once, I, once I get married, that's when, I'll, that's when I'll become a good Muslim. And there's a lot of Muslims that believe that, by the way. Right? I can do whatever I want. Once I get married, that's the time to become a good Muslim. And then they get married and it's like, yeah, you know what? Once I have kids, I'll be responsible for them. Then I'll become a good Muslim. And then they have kids and then it's just, it's a never ending story at that point. Right? And so what is this? This is, this is delaying of our tawbah. So the shaitan won't come and say, don't make tawbah, because he knows we won't, we, many of us, we won't accept that. Shaitan comes and says, no, no. If he were to say to us, never make the intention to be a good Muslim, or never make the intention to, to, to try, we'll say, no, 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 I have to make the intention to try. Yani, I have to, I, I want to make the, you know, our, our nafs, a part of it needs spirituality. So no matter what we're doing in our life, we may feel at certain points in our life that we need our spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the shaytan will say, don't worry about it. You have a need, but now is not the time. You got other things to do until we delay and delay and delay. May Allah protect us, right? So it's delaying of the uh, tawbah. Um, and even, you know, on a, taking it back to a micro level, sometimes in our daily lives, and there, there's so many examples, subhanAllah, of the influence of the shaytan. And like I said, you know, I wish I had more time to go into detail in every one of these methods of deception, uh, but I'll give you some examples. So, uh, on a micro level, or more micro level, uh, even with our prayer. So the shaitan may come, he may, he, may, he may not say, don't pray, right? Because maybe as a practicing Muslim, we won't accept that. He'll just be like, just wait a little bit, right? You got things to do, whatever, just, just wait. 
and then we delay, 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 delay until there's almost no time left. And then we either pray quickly and then we're not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Fatiha said, the person prays and the person doesn't, ma Allah illa qalila. You know, the person barely remembered Allah when they were like pecking basically up and down, up and down, just getting the, getting the salah done. Right? So, so that's the approach that Shaykh take, you know, just delay, delay, delay. And even, um, you know, similar to this, to this method of, of deception um, is the, the other end of this, which is hastiness. Um, uh, the Prophet said, said, and this, by the way, there's khilaf on this hadith, so I just want to preface that. With the hadith mentioned in Tirmidhi, Al-Ajala min shaytan some scholars consider it to be uh, strong and other scholars consider it to be weak. Uh, many of our muhaddithun uh, did consider this hadith to be authentic. Uh, but our scholars do agree that this concept is correct. That sometimes that the shaytan, uh, he, he makes us hasten. Right? So likewise, going back to the example of the prayer, right? we may, the shaytan won't say don't pray, he'll say just hurry up. Because you've got things to do. I usually give the example of somebody who um, like a college student, they have a final the next day, and they only have a, you know a limited amount of time to study. They maybe have you know eight hours of the night, and it's like Aisha time or whatever, and, the, and they're like, oh, I gotta pray, but I also only have eight hours to study or six hours to study. Right? I don't know how many college students we have in here, but I usually speak to a lot of college students. So the shaitan won't say don't pray; he'll say just hurry up and pray. Right? So a person just quickly, even in the prayer, they're worried about their exam, and, that, and that's it. Right? Like I gotta get through this. And what the shaitan isn't telling this person is that, number one, I don't know how many of you actually time the difference between a fast prayer and a slow prayer, right? But it's literally like a couple minutes difference, if that. And I'm talking about like you take your time, Allahu Akbar, and you know, take your time and you pray and you speed through it. We're talking two, three, four minutes max. How much study are you going to get in those two, three, four minutes? That's number one. Number two, where the shaitan is not going to tell us of, of the aspect of barakah. Right? That maybe we spent more time in our prayer and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in our time. And barakah in, is such an important aspect for us as, as, as Muslims, as spiritual beings. That you know, things have value just beyond what, what we see. Right? Whether it's time, whether it's, it's money. Right? Sometimes we can spend an hour doing something and we get nothing out of that hour. Right? Even people who are studying, you can, you can read a page and you can read it 10 times and you're like, I didn't get anything out of that. Right? I read the same passage 10, 15, 20 times and I didn't learn anything. Sometimes we, st- we read it once and we're like, I understand all the concepts. Right? That may be barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allowed us to get more out of our time. Right? So, uh, hastening. Another example of, of hastening is given to us by the Prophet uh, where he said uh, that the dua of a believer will continue to be accepted as long as they do not ask for a sin, meaning they don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them any something which is sinful, or the breaking of the ties of kinship, any breaking relationships, or as long as they're not hasty. So like any they're not in a hurry. As long as they don't ask for these three things, Allah will uh, continue to respond to the dua of a believer. And one of the companions said, Oh Messenger of Allah, what does it mean to be hasty in our dua? And the Prophet said, it is when a believer says, da'awt wa da'awt. I, I made dua, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and I don't see that Allah will answer my dua. Right? He said, this is what it means to be hasty. And so a person now, because of this, he says, I, 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 I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and I don't see that Allah will answer my dua. And the person leaves the dua. Right? So this is a, this is a case of being hasty. And, and we know that when it comes to dua, um, it, it, it's not that Allah doesn't answer our du'a, sometimes the answer to that is delayed, right? And sometimes Allah delays the du'a for a wisdom that we may not understand in the moment, right? Maybe, and there's, there's so many different points to be made here, but number one, sometimes Allah doesn't answer a person's du'a immediately because Allah knows that this person is benefiting more from the act of making du'a than, than they would benefit from what they're asking for, right? So for example, someone's relative is ill and the person makes dua and, and maybe this is the most sincere dua they've made in their whole life right because they really feel like they need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say oh Allah 
give shifa to, to so and so, and they make du'a, and they pour their heart out in du'a, and they've never connected with Allah in their life like this. This is the first time they've connected so intensely with Allah. And Allah leaves the answering the du'a for some time because Allah knows that the person needs more. They need more of that spirituality to reconnect them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes Allah doesn't, it's not that Allah doesn't answer the a dua, it's that Allah is maybe protecting this person from something that is not good for them. Sometimes a person may ask for something that we think is good for us, but it's not actually good for us. Right? And that is why many of our scholars, they say that when it comes, even when it comes to marriage, we shouldn't uh, make dua and say, oh Allah, allow me to marry so-and-so, no matter how much you've fallen in love or whatever it is. Right? You shouldn't say, oh Allah, uh, make me uh, uh, allow me to marry so and so, because maybe it's not maybe it's not good for you to marry this person. I know you're in love right now and everything seems amazing and you think like it's gonna be this amazing story ahead of you, right? It's, as long as khalas I can convince her parents or whatever uh, you know my parents are whatever it is. But Allah subhanahu wa taala knows that this relationship would be a terrible relationship, that it would end in divorce. May Allah protect us or you know whatever problems. Allah is protecting us from that type of relationship and therefore. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't answer uh, our du'a. Um, I'm going to get into a few more, few more methods of deception here, inshallah ta'ala. Um, fears uh, and desires. And I, and I spoke about this early, earlier as well. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about this, these particular methods of deception is that because we all have our own fears and desires, uh, once again, it's such, a, it's, such an, it's such a powerful tool of the shaytan. That whatever, you know, in my class I have people actually write down a list of their fears and desires. So once you know yourself, you know how to protect yourself against the shaytan. Right? Because the shaytan, you know, the, my desires may be different from your desires. Or my fears may be different from your fears. And if I know and I understand how the shaytan will, if I know my fears, I know that this is a door through which the shaytan uh, may attack me. Uh, desires, likewise, as, as well, as Salam said, uh, that certainly paradise has been surrounded with um, uh, with desires. Uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, Jannah has been surrounded by hardships. And the hellfire has been surrounded by uh, desires or, or, or temptations. Right. So the shaitan, as I said, very much he knows and he uh, understands this. That we all have we all have different uh, fears and desires, and he may use that uh, against us. Uh, another main method of deception of the shaytan is doubts. Doubts. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he has a discussion on kufr. And he says, um, you know, shaytan's main goal for all of us is kufr, is disbelief. And two of the main paths that he takes to get us to reach kufr is the path of uh, shahwat or the path of shubuhat. So either uh, desires, right, shahwat, or shubuhat, doubts. And it's very interesting that Hundreds of years later, now if you were to look at you know people who are maybe turning away from their faith or whatever, you know whether it be young Muslims or whatever, maybe um, almost almost everyone's reason for falling into disbelief or kufr or whatever can can fall into one of these two categories. When somebody leaves Islam or they you know their heart gets disconnected from Islam, it's either their desires, right, that led them there, or it is doubts in the deen that led them there. Right. So quickly I want to t touch upon the issue of, of doubts. Uh, we have this amazing hadith of the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the Sahihain in which the Prophet ﷺ said the shaytan, uh, shaytan ahadukum fayaqul the shaytan may come to one of you and say man khalaqa katha wa man khalaqa katha the shaytan may come to you and say who created this and who created that hatta yaqul man khalaqa rabbak until he says to you and who created your Lord. Now I want to stop here. What's interesting about this hadith is that today, you know, uh, when you hear atheists talk about, you know, people who are, you know, anti-God or anti-religion or whatever, talk about um, how God isn't real and, and so on and so forth, and some of the arguments that they bring, this is actually one of the very same argument that they bring till today, right? In you know, in main, this is a mainstream. Um, a point that is that is brought right. So basically, it's if God created everything, who created God, right? And it's supposed to oh, it's supposed to stump you like, oh man, that's it. I don't know how to answer this question. What do I do? Fourteen hundred years ago, the Prophet told us of this very same shubha, this very same doubt that a person may have. 
That's point number one. Number two, the response that the Prophet told us to have. The Prophet said, فَإِذَا بَلَغَهُ If the person reaches this point, فَلْيَسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ That a person should seek refuge in Allah and leave this type of thinking. Now, you'll hear someone say, look, shaitan, um, uh, uh, Islam doesn't have the answer. Because the Prophet said, don't think like that. That, that we are intellectually yani, deficient or whatever it may be. We don't know how to answer that question. That's incorrect. The reality is, if the Prophet wanted to answer that question, he could have answered it. He could have said, Allah is the beginning and Allah is the end. You know, there's nothing before Allah and there's no, no, nothing after Allah. And even from like a philosophical point of view, we would, you know, the concept of the uncreated creator, yani in, in order for everything to exist, there must be a creator that is uncreated, whatever. I don't want to get into that, right? But there are answers. And the Prophet very, very much could have said, this is how you answer that shubha. But what the Prophet is teaching us here is more valuable than the answer to one doubt. What is it? He is teaching us وسلم, that we're not always going to have an answer to every single doubt. But just because we don't have an answer, it doesn't mean that an answer doesn't exist. Right? And sometimes people value their intellect to such a high level that they come to this point. Like if I don't have an answer, it must mean that there is no answer. Right? And we, we, under, we, you know, we, we, we forget that we really know so very little, right? For until recently, most of the world believed that the world was flat. And even till today, subhanAllah, there are people that believe the world are flat, flat earthers, you know about them? Yeah, people today, right? And we think our intellect to be, to be so high, right? So just because there isn't, just because we don't have an answer, it doesn't mean that, the, that there isn't an answer. And also, so, understanding that you know part of our faith faith teaches us that once our once uh, our iman is established right through yes through logic and understanding and obviously we're not asked to believe anything that that you know is is nonsensical or whatever but once that that faith is is established we personally may not have the answer to every single question that is brought up right and also the second point here is that once you go down that path it's it's it, it's, it, we, we forget about the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? I can't tell you the number of times somebody's come to me and they said, you know, um, I was doing fine in my, in my faith, but I, I went to college and I took like philosophy 101, right? And, you know, by the way, the philosophy and academia, like a lot of it, the, it's, it the, it's, it's all about just questioning everything. Even if you're questioning your question, that's, that's okay. Right? There's a philosopher who said a famous statement. He said, I think, therefore I am. Has anyone heard this? Yeah? Yeah, it's a famous statement. He said, I think, therefore I am. Why did he say, make that statement? He said the statement because he was doubting his own existence. He's, he basically is like, you know, is this real? Is this real? Blah, blah, blah. You know, what is real? He said, am I even real? Do I even exist? And he came to the conclusion that because I have conscious thought, I must actually exist. I think, therefore I am. Right? And if he had gone and said this to a, to, a Bedou, to a Bedouin in the desert, the Bedouin in the desert would have smacked him in the face and said, you tell me if that's real or not. Did you feel that? And I know it seems very simplistic. Oh, that's a very crude and simplistic way, right? But as human beings, it's part of our fitrah. Right? We understand these realities in life. So once you go down the path of questioning and questioning and questioning and questioning, questioning your questions and, and so on and so forth, yeah, it, it can lead you down a path where it's, it's, it's very hard to come out of that. Right? And I'm not, I don't have anything against the study of philosophy or whatever, but as Muslims, I believe that we should be grounded, at least in our own aqidah, and we should know our principles before going and, and, and studying something like that. So, um, so the lesson here for us is, as I said, when it comes to doubt, it's very important to cut off those thoughts from the shaitan. In many of these matters, the way we, we combat uh, a lot of this is to cut off uh, those thoughts of the shaitan. Uh, last two, two methods of deception that I'll mention, even though I have a lot more, um, but I think this one is important, that is the khutuwat of shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, la tattabi'u khutuwat shaitan uh, Oh, those of you who believe, do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. Um, and this shows us once again the shaitan has footsteps. He has methods of uh, deception. So I just want to give you one like um, hypothetical but a, a very real example. 
uh, of the khutwat of the shaitan. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, the way the shaitan tries to mislead one person is not like how he would try to mislead another person. So let's say there's a brother <coughs> who is um, a practicing Muslim, um, you know, person avoids major sins for the most part, uh, as best as a person can. Uh, they've been raised in a, in a religious practicing household. Uh, they've never, you know, they've never, uh, they've never tasted alcohol in their life. They don't even know what it tastes like, right? Now this person goes to college, and they go to college, and this, you know, practicing brother, you know, prays five times a day, so on and so forth, try to follow their deen, and the shaitan comes to this guy who's, who's, you know, practicing religious, and he says to him, hey, go have a drink. What is this person going to say? What is this person going to say? Yeah, so he's going to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan, right? He's going to say, I don't, like, this is definitely from the shaitan, number one, right? Because I don't drink, I don't even have a desire to drink. He's never tasted alcohol. He doesn't, he doesn't even know, like, he's like, I don't know what is even the temptation of, of alcohol. Never tasted it, right? Has no desire for this sin. So obviously the shaitan won't do that. Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a strong strategy. What will the shaitan do? Well, one of the things that he may do is he may say, okay, you see these, these guys in your, in your university or college? They're Muslim, but they don't practice Islam. How about you go give them da'wah? Go teach them about Islam. And the person says, okay, you know, that sounds like, that's, that, sounds like that sounds good. That's a good thing to do, right? So he goes and he starts, you know, talking to them about Islam, but he doesn't get much he doesn't get a response from them. So the shaitan says, look, you can't just go and preach to them, right? You have to hang out with them, you have to spend time with them, you have to be friends, you have to, you know, and then obviously you give da'wah through your character, right? And the person thinks, he says, you know what, that's, that sounds good to me. That, you know, that's fair enough, right? That's not, that's not bad. So he, he starts to spend more time with them, he starts to hang out with them. Um, you know, they watch a couple movies and this and that, and slowly but surely what happens, he starts to enjoy spending time with them, right? And they become like really tight, right? And they go to movies and whatever stuff, pretty, pretty cool. Until one day, you know, after months and months and months and months, um, his friends come to him and say, hey, we're going, we're going to the club tonight, right? Why don't you come with us? And his initial, his instinct is to say no. Right? He's, he's actually never been clubbing. He doesn't know what it's like, whatever. And the shaitan says, look, these people are, you know, they're your friends, and look how much positive influence you've had on them. You know, none, none of them ever thought about praying before, but now a couple of them have started praying. Do you really want to cut off that relationship with them? Just go, but don't, don't drink. Don't, you just stay away. But just show them that, that you're cool, just like them, you know? You can hang out. You can be a normal Muslim. And, you know, you don't have to take part in the sin. Just go hang out. So... He says, you know, that sounds good to me. The person goes, he goes clubbing for the first time. And what happens at the club? Well, this person never been clubbing, never been in an environment like that. So he just like stays at the side, at the, at the, at the wall, right? It's, it's like an awkward type of situation. It's just weird for him and he's not truly comfortable. Until from the corner of his eye, he sees a girl that he's immediately attracted to, right? And he's heard about the concept of like love at first sight. And now he's like, is, this, is that what people talk about? Like, the love of, like, I feel love at first sight. And you know what? He looks at her a little bit, and no, you know, nothing happens. And then his friends are like, all right, let's go home. We're, you know, we're done for the night or whatever. He says, okay, let's go. Nothing happens. The next weekend comes around. And what happens the next weekend? His friends say, you want to go clubbing? And he's like, yes. Because he's hoping that he's going to see her. Right? Like he's like falling in love, head over heels. Right? Love at first sight. So now, he's just hoping just to see her. So he goes, he goes to the club, whatever, he, and fair, you know, she's there. And he sees her, and to his surprise, she approaches him. And she says, hey, I noticed you looking at me, and I saw you here last week, or whatever, like, what's your deal? And he's like, no, no, I just, you know, she says, you, you, you know, you look cool, tell me about yourself. And they start talking. Right? And they start talking a little bit, and then his friends come to say, it's time to go home. And he's like, okay, I gotta go. And he goes. And now the third weekend comes around, and they don't even say anything, and he goes, yo, you trying to go clubbing this week? Are you trying to go? And they're like, yeah, we were thinking about going, but he's like, no, no, we gotta go. 
right? <laughs> to get that one, right? So they go clubbing for the third time. And now he approaches her and he starts talking and this and that. And he's never really talked to a girl before. Right? He's never felt what it's like to have someone be interested in him. And now this girl, like she's interested in him and so on and so forth. And like he just feels, it's amazing, right? He feels like he's in love and that, the love is just amazing. And now, you know, she's like, I'm headed over to, to the bar. Like, you, are you coming? And he says, yeah, of course. And she goes and, and, sh and she orders a drink. And she says, are you getting something? And now, he's never had alcohol, he's never tasted alcohol. But he's like madly in love. And he's like, man, a girl like that, interested in me, like I never thought that would happen, right? So now that she's interested in me, what if I, what if I say no, like, oh, I don't drink or whatever, right? I'm not, you know, and I, I lose her, this is the love of my life. And so he decides to order his first drink. And there at the bar, he has his first drink, first sip of alcohol, right? And now what, what happened? Was this an overnight, was this an immediate process? No. This is the khutuwat of the shaitan, right? Like it's a step by step by step process that led this person eventually to commit a sin. And you know why the strategy is so brilliant? Because the shaitan needs to do a, a certain amount of work and then at some point the shaitan can allow the nafs to take over. Because we know, by the way, our desire for sins, our inclination towards sins can come from a few different places. Sometimes they're from the shaitan, I mean the shaitan says, look how nice this sin is, or whatever, or why don't you try this, or whatever. Sometimes it's our own nafs. Inna nafsa la ammaratun bisu. The nafs commands one to do evil. When does that happen? Well, when we ourselves, we desire a sin. So initially, this dude had his first sip of alcohol. He's like, this tastes nasty. But then he has some more, he has some more, he starts to enjoy it. And at some point, he enjoys it so much that the person enjoys it for himself. The shaitan says, I take a back seat. I got, I'm good. You take over. Your nafs can take over now. Now the person's own nafs is taken over. And the person may, may love protectus even lead to addiction and, and so on and so forth. And by the way, another example of this is pornography. I'm not going to get into pornography. I should talk about it in my seminar because I feel like it's a very real problem. And we, need, we do need to have this discussion because a lot of young people are addicted to pornography. And, but it's a, it's a longer discussion, but also, you know, speaking of pornography, that is a step-by-step -step process as well, right? Um, and and that, that culture as a whole, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Uh, lastly, I want to I mention this, this last method of deception. And as I said, there are, there are quite a few more, and I wish I had more time to go over uh, all of these. Uh, but probably the most severe and the most powerful method of deception of the shaytan uh, is, a, is a loss of hope is a loss of hope. The, the, 